different stuff when you want. So this is a this is a bit of a test recording on this. So it won't work, so don't expect anything because <laughs> <laughs> hopefully next week. We'll <laughs> that's true for the <laughs> that's true for the whole uh, talk. Okay, so I just start. So, uh, uh, so I'm going to present uh, our result on uh, W plus three jets at NLO. The work has been done in collaboration with a lot of people. So it's uh, Carola Berger, Svibern, Lance Dixon, uh, Fernando Febres, Darren Ford, Aralita, uh, David Kosova, and Tanyu Gleisberg. So I was thinking of my schedule for this uh, afternoon and I thought I was uh, quite sandwiched between between two example classes so I had a, an, a meeting for example class and then after this talk at uh, 315 I have example classes and I thought that's quite fitting because the bread in a sandwich is always the thing that you eat. doesn't taste so much but you kind of need it for a sandwich so <coughs> you have the time axis for the plant so the time goes down so I've already done the first bread slice, but the bread is not what you need for a sandwich. What you, you do the sandwich for is uh, the meat, and that's going to be the result that I will show in, my second, in the second part of the talk. And then only ham and bread is not really a sandwich, so you have to put something in to make it look healthy, and that's going to be the introduction. And you can see, and you can see some, uh, some uh, white stuff over there, and uh, as Phil mentioned, so I'm going to test everything here. So I'm going to test the whiteboard too uh, at some occasions during the introduction. So let's see how it works. Uh, so you've seen we are quite a big collaboration. So you, you have to have a good motivation to get nine theorists to work together. And our motivation is that we need a good theoretical uh, prediction for processes at the uh, LHC or for Tevatron. And you need uh, good predictions for both the signal of what you want to measure, what you want to discover, as well as of all the backgrounds that will prevent you from seeing that signal. And in fact, a lot of measurements are, as of now, limited by our ability to uh, model the background. And that's partly due to uh, theory limitations. So a lot of theory prediction needs uh, to be improved. Uh, and to, uh, to show that, uh, I have a couple of plots of experimentalists that I like. So to show how difficult their task is. So it's difficult to see the signal in, in the data, and it's even difficult to see it in the plots, usually. So they have to apply some tricks. So for example, the log scale trick is a good trick, so that the signal is not too low down. Then there are other tricks. You can multiply the signal by 10, and then, then you start seeing it. It's not easy to do in the experiment, but anyway. So you see, with such a small signal, you better understand all the background very well before you can claim to see it. And then, like every good trick, you can combine them and multiply by 10 the signal and then the log scale. And still, it doesn't look so great. Uh, so we really need to understand all the background if we want to uh, be able to claim a uh, discovery of a signal. So uh, <coughs> the easiest way to, guess, uh, to get a theory prediction is using just leading order tools. There are a lot of tools that are very good for leading order with a non-exhaustive list here. There are some problems with uh, leading order predictions. They have a large uh, factorization and renormalization uh, scale dependence, uh, for example. Uh, there are many improvements you can do on these predictions. Uh, so you can, for example, attach a pattern shower to it to resume some collinear and soft uh, logarithms. You can do a uh, matrix element matching. You can do some resummation uh, in so, uh, for some uh, kinematical region. Or you could add more orders in the uh, perturbation theory, and that's what we are going to do in this talk. So <coughs> we are going to go one higher order in the uh, alpha strong uh, series. And we are, are going to consider next to leading order corrections. So what, what is it? So <coughs> if you consider one observable, 
and the leading order for it would be given by this event, then uh, to get the next two leading order correction, you add to that prediction everything that, uh, that has one order more in alpha s, but still gives the same observable. And if you have one more coupling in your budget, so what you can do is you can form a loop, and that's called the uh, virtual corrections. And what you can also do is to split one of the fi final state or one of the initial state uh, particles in two particles in such a way that uh, your observable doesn't see it and uh, therefore contributes to the same uh, observable or the same bin. And these corrections are called uh, real corrections. Uh, so the next leading order corrections are needed if you want to have a good theoretical understanding of the QCD processes. They improve the leading order um, predictions by uh, <coughs> curing a couple of problems that the, or uh, they, they don't cure them entirely, but they improve on some problems that the leading order uh, predictions have. We have a problem with the absolute normalization of the leading order that is not very uh, fixed, then uh, the next two leading order correction can be quite large since alpha s is not very small, so the perturbation theory um, works, but it doesn't converge extremely fast. And <coughs> another good side effect of uh, next two leading order corrections is that it reduces the renormalization scale dependency. So when you start for, uh, with W plus jets, uh, or you start with just W projection, uh, production and then you add one jet, two jet, and so on. Every time you add one coupling constant alpha s, and this alpha s depends on the renormalization uh, scale. And so every time you add a jet, you multiply by a factor that can move with the scale. And so every time you add a jet, your, your scale dependency is uh, growing and growing, and at leading order, you have nothing to counterbalance it. Whereas at uh, next to leading order, you have the virtual piece that is going to counterbalance these uh, growth of the dependency. And so you see that the next to leading order scale dependency is much more uh, uh, stable or it's, uh, the growth is much more uh, controlled than at leading order. Uh, next to leading order correction can also affect shapes of some uh, distributions, so you also want to have them uh, when you compare data to uh, theory. So if you want to compute uh, next to leading order corrections, so what you have to do is, as before, you compute the tree, but then you have to add the virtual corrections and the real corrections. So that sounds okay, but the problem, the first problem you have is that both these two contributions uh, are infrared divergent, so <coughs> if you were to compute them naively, you would get infinity, uh, minus, minus infinity and infinity, and that doesn't give you a numerical uh, sound result. So you have to compute them in some way together. But the problem is that these two don't live in the same phase space. So the virtual part is in n particle phase space, and the real has one more particle. So you have to find a way to tell these two integrations that uh, they are okay together. And the way that is done is using a subtraction term. So we take a term that we subtract from the real and add back to the uh, virtual part. We choose this term in such a way that the real uh, matrix element minus this subtraction term is finite so that you can integrate it numerically. Uh, but you choose it also in a way that it is in e easy enough so that you can integrate the, uh, the subtraction term over the singular phase space analytically so that uh, <coughs> you can reduce this n plus 1 phase space integral of the subtraction term to uh, a n particle phase space. And so what you get in the end is this formula for a numerical next to leading order cross section is the tree, then you have the virtual correction, then the subtraction term, and then you have the subtracted real emission term that is uh, finite and that you can integrate numerically. 
So and this formula also gives you. Yes. I'm not even sure you. You could say that the amplitude itself is a finite class plus a divergent class. Then uh, in the cross section you have some of the squares of all the amplitude. So what? when you're subtracting, are you correcting a squared? Or you're correcting. You're correct, a squared. Because uh, I, I don't think you could subtract at the amplitude level because you have all the interferences. No, yeah. you can. Yeah. And you have color correlations. You have stuff which is like a sum, like A and cup and B. We write every amplitude as a, as a part which has epsilon poles in it from a infrared resolution. That's true for the group, but that's not true for the group of the group. Think about how you. Basically, yeah, I, I do the cutting. Yeah, that makes sense. But in any case, it's also a completely valid method. Right, and it's uh, You're saying actually it's not, not only completely valid, it's also the only method. I'm not saying it's the only one, but uh, I'm I think pretty sure. <laughs> 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 I think it's only Okay. So the, this formula is also the, the list of tasks that you can uh, give to people. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, or perhaps I, as I forgot to mention before, so we are getting our results uh, by combining two programs, Black Hat and Sherpa. And then we also have to distribute the task. And we do that in a quite uh, unfair way because we were doing the virtual part. And we let Sherpa do all the rest. So the, the tree uh, uh, contribution, then the subtraction, then the real uh, emission matrix element, the subtraction. And actually, to be fair, they also do this integral, this integral, and this integral. They also do the sum, actually. So we, we just do the sigma. Uh, so i just shortly, briefly uh, introduce these two programs. Uh, I'm not going to say much about Sherpa, because most people in the audience, uh, audience know more about it than I do. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a C++ program that provides uh, an efficient phase space integration, which is very nice for us. It has event generation, so we can generate nice plots with uh, its analytic framework. And uh, it has the, an automated way of constructing these uh, subtraction terms I uh, was uh, talking about two slides ago. And it has, of course, much more features, but that are not necessarily relevant for uh, this talk. If you want to know more, you certainly have somebody in your office that uh, is working on Sherpa. So I'll say a little bit more about Black Hat. Uh, so Black Hat is also written in C++. So our goal is to automate the computation of virtual one loop amplitudes for QCD processes at first. And if it works for all QCD processes, then we might consider going further. But it's already ambitious enough. Uh, <coughs> we're using in the implementation of this program some new progress that have come up in the last years. Uh, using uh, so-called unitarity technique and uh, spin-off formalism. And one of the things that, that I use a lot is uh, using complex momenta instead of just real momenta. Uh, when you compute an amplitude using unitarity techniques, you usually have two parts to compute. It's one that's called cut part, and one is called rational part. The cut part is everything that has logarithms and rational part has no logarithms or polylogarithms. And uh, we have two different ways of computing this rational part. Uh, <coughs> but I'll concentrate mostly on how to compute the cut part. Um, so, so I had a lot of slides on uh, how to compute cuts. And I had to rush through uh, all of them. and. Uh, I thought this time I could do something different, and I'll just do a very simple example to see uh, to show how a cut works, and then you'll have to extrapolate it to all other type of cuts. So uh, for this uh, example, I just take a toy amplitude a. It's given by some numerator that comes from the Feynman diagrams, and then I just say that it has only three propagators inside. Oh, uh, I'm missing a square here, sorry. So 
these are three propagators. I'm just saying there are no amplitudes that have more than three propagators. Now, most people know that uh, you can do, so the, the traditional way of computing this would be to do a ten tensor reduction, and you would end up with some coefficients, t or b1, b2, b3, multiplying scalar integral functions, uh, i3, i2, uh, given here. And in fact, the whole work is to get t and the b's, and uh, then you can just look the values of these integrals up in some papers or some packages. So what we want is to find, in this example, we want to find the coefficient of the triangle scalar integral here. Uh, and we want to find it in a way that uh, prevents us from doing any integrals. We don't like integrals. Uh, we also don't like algebraic manipulations. So we want to do everything, if possible, numerically. Uh, so I'll start with this amplitude, and then I plug in back the definition of the, uh, of the scalar integrals. So the triangle scalar integral is just an integral over the uh, loop momentum of the three propagators. And then I have three terms where I have only two propagators. Then I can bring everything back onto one denominator, and I have t plus than the bubble coefficients times some propagators. Now, it would be nice if I could put p1, p2, and p3 to 0, then I would have only t. But oops, I have p1, p2, and p3 in the denominator. So I can't really put them to 0. But what I'm going to do is to define a cut by replacing one of a, a propagator under the integral sign with a delta function. And if I do that, here, and I apply three cuts, so one for P1, one for P2, and one for P3, then I replace all these denominators with delta function so that these three terms will vanish because of the delta function. Now, since it's an equality, you have to do the same operation, if you want, on the left side uh, of the equation, and that's applying a cut on the amplitude. And uh, I like to show what's happening uh, for the amplitude if you apply this cut. And that's where I try to use the whiteboard. So you can represent this toy amplitude I have graphically if you want, like that. So you have your three uh, propagators, and then at the corners you have some trees. And <coughs> you can think of it as the sum of all Feynman diagrams that have these three propagators. And here you have all possible Feynman diagrams that gives the extern external particles. Now, since it's a sum of Feynman diagrams, so we will have some propagators, and uh, we might have I have to rewrite it the normal way. So you might have a fermion propagator, let's say p slash over p squared, or you might have a gluon propagator. And that's g mu nu over p squared. Uh, forgetting about all the i's and minus i's. So and <coughs> now, when I uh, perform the cut, I get rid of the p squared, and I get the delta function. So then I can use the identity that p slash is sum of a polarization, u bar p, u of p and that g mu nu is up to a normalization, perhaps. So I can write the p slash in the propagator as a sum of external wave function 
That, of course, only works if I am on shell. But that's the case in my cut. I'm putting p squared to 0 explicitly with the delta function. Uh, this second identity is also true only uh, for p squared equals 0. And so <coughs> what is happening is I'm taking a propagator and I'm splitting it into two external wave functions. So what is happening is that I'm transforming a propagator into two, two separate pieces with external wave function attached to them. So on the picture, so that means that I have my tree, and wherever I have a propagator on which I apply a cut, I replace it with two external states. And so now my amplitude will be replaced by a product of three trees. Now I should go back uh, to this side. So what I've done on the blackboard, on the whiteboard, sorry, was to apply the cut on the amplitude. And if I apply the cut on that side, what I get is t and then the three delta, delta function. If I put a t is, doesn't depend on the loop momentum, so I can take it out. And then all I have to do is to integrate delta functions over the phase space, and I get some kind of Jacobian, which I will ignore in the next time. So what I just uh, did on the blackboard is to show that if you apply cut on an amplitude, on a one-loop amplitude, then what you get is a product of trees with delta functions. And now this integral is the integral over the uh, loop momentum, and it's uh, in four dimensions. So I have four integrals. So the, the integral is over four variables, and I have three delta function. So I'm left with only one free variable, which I will call t. And then I have these trees that uh, depend on the momenta that goes along the propagator that I just cut. So I have, in total, a function of t that is just a product of these trees and the Jacobian. And now, <coughs> I said I don't like integrals. So I'd like not even to do this t integral. So now, if I know enough about this function i of t, I can uh, get away with not doing this integral at all. And I'd like to show how that could work in a simple example and let you extrapolate to a uh, more difficult example. So I go back to the blackboard. So I was supposed to use this one. So So it's erased much better on the screen than on the whiteboard. OK, so <coughs> suppose we, we know something about the integrand as a function of t. Suppose I know oh, it has a very simple form. It's c0 plus some coefficient c1 times t. And that's it. That's just my integrand. I know it will have this form, but I have no clue what c1 and c0 are. And uh, let's suppose for this exercise that the integration region is between 0 and 1. So now the integral I have to do, uh, and we'll also take the Jacobian to be uh, 1, is I have to integrate i of t between 0 and 1. And then that's a uh, level one math exercise. Let's hope I do it right. So that's the form I get. But now if I 
were to evaluate i at t equals 0, I would get c0. If I do the same for i at t equals 1, then I get c of 0 plus c of 1. No. I, I'm just doing i of t. i of t at 1 is c1. I was afraid. So now that I know that, I can get back this answer by saying i is just i of 0 plus i of 1 divided by 2. So provided you know what the functional form is of your integrand, you know the integration range, and you test it with enough uh, parameters, you can construct back the value of the integrand. And that's what we are doing when we do the cuts. We know, given uh, what kind of theory we are uh, working with, we know the maximum powers of t that will appear because t is related to the loop momenta. And uh, it's going to be more or less a polynomial. And from that knowledge, we can parameterize what i of t is, then do this exercise that I just uh, did on the blackboard, and then infer the value of the integral just from sampling the integrand at some values. Uh, in principle, sometimes you need, need less. You, you need n plus 1 if you want to have all, all coefficients. But if you're only interested in one coefficient sometimes, so <coughs> if you were only interested in c0, perhaps you could get away with only one. Uh, in principle, you need as, uh, uh, as many sample points as there are parameters. But sometimes if you, you don't want to have the full information, you can get away with less. OK? So I just told you how to get, uh, so how to compute the cut is by computing product of trees. And now uh, I told you how to do this integration is by just sampling over carefully chosen points. That's summarized here. So if you give me an external momentum configuration and I want to compute the, cu uh, the cut part for the amplitude, what I do is I generate carefully chosen loop momenta that sampled in the right way will give me the coefficient of the integral I'm looking for. So that's only half of the uh, problem. So I have the cut part, but I'm still supposed to get the rational part. And for that, there are two, two different techniques. Uh, it's quite technical, so I, I'd like to skip it to go straight to the application uh, of W plus jets. Uh, still some time before the example classes. So W plus jets processes are quite important. They are both important for the standard model, because when, when we're going to eventually start LHC, the first thing you have to do is to make sure you can reproduce what you already knew. And uh, vector boson production plus jet is uh, prime candidate for doing that. Then W plus jets and Z plus jets uh, are also background for Higgs searches, for TT bar, or single top, and others in that model processes, but that's the most prominent ones. And then obviously, uh, W and Z plus jet processes are background to more or less every possible new physics scenario. You have to be quite inventive to find a scenario where you don't have W plus jet as a background. And uh, <coughs> since at LHC the cross-section would be quite large, it's even uh, a possibility to use W or Z plus jet as a luminosity, an on-site luminosity determination uh, for LHC. So I just plot some nice pictures of some of the Feynman diagrams that contribute to uh, W plus three jets. So, <coughs> So far, it was possible to get on the market uh, NLO computation for W plus 1 and 2 jets. 
And then if you look at the time scale, so those were available quite long ago. I think th this one was 94. Then for a long time, nothing happened because uh, W plus 3 digit was quite difficult. But then two years ago, uh, with uh, advance in, in this unitarity technique, so some progress has been made. So we start by computing amplitudes, and then we ascend them into cross-section, and then we finally get to uh, these uh, complete cross-section that I'm going to present now. So <coughs> W plus jet is not only something for theorists to play with, it's uh, actually a process that has been measured at Tevatron. So there's a paper that is quite old, uh, has a quite small data sample of 320 inverse picobarn that compares the production of W plus jet with uh, NLO. So that's this result that, uh, from MCFM and uh, two different uh, tree level schemes with merging. And so you can see the results on this page. So you have the NLO in gray and you have these two tree uh, level uh, schemes uh, in blue and red. And you have, so it's the data normalized by the result. And one thing that you can see is that the next to leading order result is in general in very good agreement with the data. And that the, the tree level tool don't always do as well uh, as the next to leading order. Another thing that you will notice is that there's no NLO block for the W plus 3 jet. That's because at that time, uh, no results were available. And so what we want is to put this block for this result here. Or I should also say that this data has been uh, corrected by the experimentalist back to a uh, particle level so that this kind of uh, comparison is uh, meaningful, more or less. So, so you can argue whether it's good or not to let the experimentalist uh, correct for these, uh, uh, correct back the data to particle level. But uh, unless there's something like that, a comparison like that doesn't make much sense. So here we go. So that's uh, W plus 2 jet. So that was already known, but we reproduced it. So you have in black the NLO curve. You have in blue the leading order curve. Uh, it's easier to see on this part of the plot where we normalize uh, the leading order and the data to the uh, next to leading order prediction. And so you can see that uh, the data, or no, it's the other way around. So the, our prediction agrees with the data quite well. You can see that the, the tree level prediction is uh, not flat compared to the uh, next to leading order. And the most striking thing is to see the difference in the scale dependence that is shown here with this gray and orange band. So the gray band is the dependence of the next to leading order, and the orange band is the one of the leading order. And you see that the leading order scale dependence is much larger than the one of the next to leading order. So now we go to uh, W3 jets. Uh, it's the same plot, more or less. So again, the black line is the next to leading order. The blue one is leading order. You can see more or less the same things that at W plus 2 jets. So the scale dependence bar are much smaller than the leading order ones. And the data is uh, in agreement with the prediction within the arrow bars. So then we thought, OK, we've done it for the Tevatron, so let's uh, do it for uh, LHC. That's easy. We uh, spend uh, five minutes uh, on the web to figure out what the latest energy is for LHC. And then we change one p bar for p in our input files and uh, see what happens. And then we were quite disappointed because a lot of things went wrong with our fir first trial. So first, uh, there was something very embarrassing. So it's a, it's a distribution, but at some point it got negative. So that's quite embarrassing for cross-section. And then when we looked at the k factor, the k factor was growing very fast in this distribution. It's the, the ET of the second jet. And also, the <coughs> so one of the 
propaganda argument for next leading orders. Oh, the scale variation is small. And then uh, here you can see the scale variation isn't small at all. So there were three things that we really didn't like about that. And the source of all this problem was the choice of the renormalization scale that was chosen to be the same as the one at Tevatron should be the transverse uh, energy of the W boson. And I'll try to explain why that goes wrong and what we can do uh, to fix it. So first, a uh, small recap on the, the scale choice. So when, whenever we do a theory prediction, we have, uh, so if you can compute all orders, you're fine. But if you do a perturbation theory uh, calculation, you have a problem. You have a dependence on the renormalization scale and the factorization scale that comes from the fact that you cannot compute all uh, orders in uh, perturbation theory. And so what you have to do, so wh when you just put the nice formula on the paper, the analytical formula, it's fine to have mu somewhere. But whenever you have a numerical program, you have to set a value for this mu. And so what you try to do is to set it, the scale to something typical for the process. Because you know that whatever has to compensate for this dependency is going to come in the form of logarithms involving scales in your process. So the closer you are to the typical scales, the smaller these logarithms that you don't have are going to be, so your dependence will be small and you'll be closer to the true result. Uh, <coughs> but then there's a problem in a lot of processes that are reasonably complicated. There's not only one scale, there's more than one scale. Then uh, you have only one scale you can choose, so uh, <coughs> it's not guaranteed to work well. Uh, a way you can decide whether your choice is good or not is to look at the embarrassing things. So of course you want a cross-section and all distribution should be positive. Otherwise you know it's not a good choice. And another thing that is good to have is to have the next to leading or uh, the, the shape of the next to leading order not to change much compared to the leading order. So that also a good sign that your choice uh, of scale is good. So here are two possible choices. So that, that's the one we made first is the transverse energy of the W. But we are proposing another scale, which is called HT, and that's the sum of the transverse energies of all particles. So not only the W, but also all jets. You mentioned the two scales. You are thinking of setting the two scales together, the factorization, the renormalization. Yeah. You are taking, even though let's say there are two scales, you are taking them to be the same. Yeah, it, it's very common to take yeah. them to be the same. Uh, what I was saying before with more than one scale, it's what when you have, uh, I don't know, a W boson then you have the, the mass of the W as one of the scales, and then you might have l high PT jets, and that's another scale. And if you have a, I don't know, TT bar pair, then you might have a yet another scale, and then you have to choose between them. You could try to put different scales for different vertices, but it gets very messy. So <coughs> these two scales are good or less good for different scenarios. So let's consider two possible scenarios. So in, in one case, we have the W boson that is emitted with a very large transverse energy, and all three jets are emitted backwards, and they balance so the missing e uh, the ET of the W this way. But we can have another situation where the most energetic particles are the two jets, the two first jets, and then with what's left of the center of mass energy, then we just emit a small W and a small jet. And so in this situation, the transverse energy of the W is much smaller as the overall scale of the process. In this case, we are going to underestimate uh, the, the scale that we set uh, for our process. And that's actually what's happening in the plot I showed you before. Is actually at the end of this distribution, the bulk of the contribution comes from this kind of con uh, configuration where the W uh, boson is actually very soft compared to the jet. And if we choose this scale, we are going to choose a scale that is much too small for the process. And then the virtual correction will be much too large and will uh, even overwhelm the uh, tree level contribution and will get a negative distribution. 
And <coughs> so HT is also not bad in this situation because if the W has a very large transverse energy, it's going to be taken care of here or taken into account here. So HD is probably a, a good way of uh, interpolating between these two situations. And that's why we're going to use HT uh, for our results for the LHC. And you can see here, so that's the transverse mass of the W. That's a plot I showed before. And that's when we use HD. All problems are fixed. No embarrassment over there, no negative cross-section. So you can see that the K factor is not growing uh, as uh, badly as here. And you can see that the scale dependency of the next leading order is under control and it's not growing like it uh, was growing over there. So we looked at other distributions to see if that was a trend. And you can, uh, so here it's a, a digit mass and that's a delta R. And we plot in uh, black the ratio between the uh, leading order, the next to leading order using HT as a scale. And in red, it's when we use uh, the transverse mass of the boson. And you see that the K factor is basically constant for HT, whereas it grows with uh, the in, uh, transverse mass of the W scale choice. And that's a sign that somehow some large logarithms are being introduced here uh, with this scale choice and not, or probably not, with this scale choice. The same happens here. So uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work for everything. So uh, for a lot of distributions that are specifically sp sensitive to the W, then using the W to choose a scale is the right choice. For example, if you're looking at PT distribution of the W itself or its decay product, then uh, you will be uh, uh, fine with using the transverse mass of the W. So, and we, we've also seen some small effect of the changing the scale between uh, ET of the W and uh, HT at the Tevatron, but the effects were quite small because they don't really get to have enough energy for two jets to make a W uh, boson look small compared to them. Okay, and here finally we get to uh, W plus three jet at the LHC where we use HD as our scale choice. That's a prediction. So we'd like the experimentalist to put some data here, 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 there, and here on the one line, please. Uh, it's the same as almost everywhere. So the, the K factor is pretty much constant. So that's actually quite nice. Uh, especially if you, you don't want to compute next to leading order corrections, and you can say, oh, but look here, the K factor is constant. Uh, but we don't really recommend it. Uh, the scale variation is small uh, for the W, uh, for the next to leading order uh, result, and it's larger for the tree level result. Uh, and that's what I have to say for that one. So, and that. Uh, the end on time, very good. Uh, so I showed you the next to leading order W plus three jet uh, comparison with uh, the Tevatron data. I <coughs> also presented uh, results for the LHC uh, and some uh, distribution that have not been measured at Tevatron. And uh, I hope this shows you the potential of these unitarity technique for uh, phenomenological applications. We have that option, but we are also using this d dimensional unitarity uh, technique. As a, as a default? Yeah, or? Uh, default. 
so the the recursion was faster, but we kind of gave up on it and uh, put all the effort on the other one. So now it's an unfair competition. So the the, the recursive one uh, stays where it is, and we're getting the other one quicker and quicker. Uh, but uh, the d-dimensional one is, is better, it's more flexible. Uh, Why did you give up on the recursion? It's uh, for the, the leading order, uh, the leading color one, it was quite nice uh, and quick because you have very few terms. When you take um, sub-leading color terms, then um, you have particles that moves around. And the, the main problem with the recursion that you had to find a shift that was good and it's more and more difficult the more subleading in color you go. And that was uh, too much of a pain. And that was also not something that could get automated very well. Uh, so we uh, always have to, to have somebody sit for a couple of days and think about it. And we don't want to have to do that for every process. Yes, not not by a lot, but uh, it's perhaps two times more. It's difficult, so now it's really a moving target. Uh, it depends also on the processes. So if you if you compare the the the, the subleading color tree uh, cut part with the subleading uh, with the corresponding rational term, the, the difference is less than if you compare the, the uh, leading color ones. But it's it's not like a factor of ten uh, small, uh, faster on. So it's so we're we're coming along, and at some point we will not have to make a big distinction between the two. In a sense of d-dimensional inequality, right? We don't see the need to separate things into cuts and rational parts in a certain sense. Like in d-dimensional, yeah. everything is cut. Uh, yes. Well, it's nicer to do the cuts in four dimensions. It's quicker. So you could do it in d-dimension. It takes you more time. You do twice the th same thing, but that is slightly more difficult and takes more time. Or you do one piece quickly, and then the, uh, y but then you have to have another method for the second one. Uh, so if, if we had to start from scratch, we'd probably have to think about it. But now, uh, with, with the setup we had, uh, it wasn't a big discussion. Uh, the Feynman diagram? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, um, I had that on the slide. Uh, so that that sounds quite interesting. So uh, one thing we could do, if it turns out that the rational part are too much of a pain, is to use this Feynman, these special Feynman diagrams just for the rational part, compute them once, although we don't like analytics, and then plug them in as a, a formula I in uh, our framework. Uh, I don't know how they compare speed-wise. Uh, Perhaps there's also a way to translate that to uh, to use on top of unitarity and uh, uh, have a unitarity way of doing these special Feynman rules. That's probably a way, and probably if you work a lot on it, then you will end up doing more or less what we are doing uh, using uh, these special uh, d-dimensional unitarity uh, cuts. Uh, we we did that with twice MW because ju just uh, yeah uh, yeah I think the plot is in the paper uh, somewhere. Uh, if you choose a, a large enough fixed scale, it's not unphysical. But uh, if you you take the just the transverse energy of the W, then you, you run into problem.
your model is guaranteed to have at least one jet hanging around at, at really low P, uh, PT as low as it can get. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in a sense, what we take the alpha S, which is responsible for heat emission, at an extremely high scale. Mm -hmm. so yeah, so we, we so found that. that you that you actually kind of underestimate the cost of heat. Yeah. Uh, so, so w we did everything with HT, and and our next uh, work we're probably going to go for HT divided by the number of jets or something like that, yeah. uh, because yeah, HT tends to to get it, it, too it large. It, it gets really gigantic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's okay. Uh, in this case, it was okay, but probably uh, so in the next uh, uh, papers and work we're going to do, well, we were discussing about. Uh, divided by n, or n minus 1, or n plus 1. But it's probably going to be n. Yeah, where, where n is the number of jets. Part objects. Why not part objects? I mean, you have, you have these three of the of the electron boson. Well, si since we're mostly doing one vector boson plus jets, it's, okay. it's exactly that discussion whether we, we do n plus 1 or n minus 1. What Yeah, let's get kind personal. Of, kind of <laughs> thing that, um, have, have you tried to rescale your result with some alpha s factor of pt of the jet over alpha s pt at the scale that I, where you calculated? No, we've not tried that. Uh, My feeling is that if you do this for both leading order and exceeding order, you get it even nicer. Well, I found that already quite nice. Yeah, yeah. We were but, but it was it was nice with the specific choice. What I'm after is that you maybe can get away with kind of whatever choice. Oh, okay. That's nice. Oh, so you, so you, you're saying you, we could fix the ETW yeah. scale choice yeah. with only one correction, or you would go for okay. as many corrections as there are jets? With as many alpha s ratios. That, that sounds like a, a little bit more of not cheating, but fiddling around. It's a scale yeah. choice. You choose one scale, and uh, okay. but uh, it's probably uh, it's probably right. But that, that's what I was saying. As in principle, you could also try to track down what was happening and put the uh, the scale at every vertex to be some kind of PT or virtuality, that, that, that's more or less doing what the pattern shower is doing, so kind of trying to, to get the history of what happened and then put the scales there. But I uh, don't know if that would work. That would probably not be very easy yeah. uh, to do because you, you don't really know and perhaps you, you're not allowed to know what really happened at the pattern level. I don't know. Three more minutes. Yeah, <laughs>